Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Sana, and this might not be what you expect when you hear physics and nuclear energy, but I'm actually used to working in very technical industries, and they tend to value rationality above anything else. But in the meantime, I'm also just a 25-year-old girl who loves to party and just took up kickboxing with her best friend. And this is actually what I want to talk about, because I realize for myself that I have these two lives that I live. I have this life before 5 p.m., and then I have this life after 5 p.m. And these are really different. And I think that this might be a symptom of how far technical industries, and specifically the nuclear industry, is removed from the rest of society. So today, I'm not going to try and educate you on nuclear energy and throw a bunch of equations on you. I'm also not going to try and convince you to become pro-nuclear in any way. But I do realize that you might be interested to learn more after this. So we've actually made an information pamphlet that you will find afterwards and that you can read after the talk. So let me tell you a bit more about what I mean with these two lives. And I'm going to do this by telling you about two conversations I've had. Typical conversations, actually. And the first one is at work. So I recently started this new project at work, and it requires me to go into the middle of nowhere, like some industry terrain. And the office is basically a big container. And the first day, I walked in, opened the door, and I just realized everyone was male, and everyone was over the age of 50. So I took a deep breath, and I said, OK, you know, I've got this. I know what I'm doing. I can do my work and show them how much I know, kick ass at this new project. So I sat down at my desk, and at that point, a colleague came over, Dave. And he introduced himself by saying, literally, Dave. So I said, hey, Dave. My name's Sana. I just started here. I hope it's OK if I sit at this desk. And Dave responded by saying, planning. I was like, excuse me, what? He said, planning. I work in planning. I was like, oh, that's really cool. I actually have a friend who's doing something very similar. Maybe you know him, because he did a project before that's also in this industry terrain. And while I was blabbing on, Dave went away and sat back at his desk. <laughs> so I realized, OK, my bonding isn't going great. Uh, and honestly, I'm laughing about it now, but it made me feel really lonely. I sat there, and I was like, oh, god, how am I going to do this? So that was the first conversation. Then another conversation. The last party I went to was a birthday party, my friend's birthday party. And the first guy I met at this party was a guy named Tom. He was about 30 years old and told me he worked in PR. Then he asked me what I do for a living. So I told him, I'm a nuclear physicist. Now at that moment, the mood changed. And Tom became quite angry almost. He started telling me all the things he hates about nuclear energy, how, uh, how bad he thinks the industry is, and he told me how scared he was. He told me he stopped eating sushi for two years after the Fukushima accident. And I mean, it was really awkward. I was standing there and I realized to him, I wasn't Sana, a girl, I was the nuclear industry. So I didn't feel welcome. It was like I wasn't allowed to be and a nuclear physicist and attend this birthday party. I'd have to choose some way. So here I am, meeting these two guys. On the one hand, we have Dave, whom I'm trying to connect with, you know, bond with. I'm going to be there eight hours a day for like four months. And on the other hand, I have Tom, who clearly showed a lot of emotions and really couldn't separate me from the industry. Now, I could see this as a personal challenge. I could say, OK, you know what? I'm going to become best friends with Dave, and he's going to love me. And I can say, OK, I'm going to sit down with Tom, and I'm going to try and find out where these feelings are coming from. Maybe explain something about nuclear energy that will make him feel less scared, at least. But it did make me wonder where these things came from. Where do these perceptions come from? So let's go back to the beginning of nuclear energy and the origins of Dave and Tom. So nuclear energy really became a thing around the 1950s. Before that, everything related to it was military. Atomic bombs, basically. 
But then in the 50s, they started building power plants. Nuclear energy was a thing. A lot of reactors were being built, and a lot of energy was being produced. And no one really talked about that. The only thing you would see is you have that memory of atomic bombs in the back of your head, and you see whatever is on TV in the entertainment industry. And those are things like this. James Bond in Goldfinger attached to a nuclear bomb, trying to demantle it. And here's Godzilla, this creature that came out of the sea and is completely empowered by radiation, is terrifying everyone. And even still now, we see Homer Simpson, you know, chilling on his operating table, playing on his iPad, while he's supposed to be running a nuclear reactor. So everything was going really well, actually. The industry was thriving, everything was good, until something happened. Who here knows what happened? Exactly, the accidents happened. That changed everything. First you had Three Mile Island, then you had Chernobyl, and then 25 years later in 2011, Fukushima. And the media broadcasted these accidents widely. And we all know that the media likes to trigger our feelings and emotions. That's how they get to us. So they use the preconceptions that were already there, these memories of atomic bombs and everything that we'd seen in films and video games to sensationalize what was happening because it was so uncertain. No one really knew what was happening. Because we know that there is nothing easier to sell than fear. And that's what the media did. Let me give you a good example of this. Only recently, this picture went viral in North America. And at first sight, I was like, oh, shit. Something is spreading, and it's really dangerous. Because we, we, we can read, holy Fukushima, radiation from Japan is already killing North Americans. And you see this map, really intense colors, red, spreading from the east of Japan, reaching North America. And this spread only a year or two years ago. But this picture is actually this picture. And this is a map from the Institute of Tsunami Research that here shows the height of the waves of the tsunami at the moment of the accident. So there is no radiation spread, not from this picture. And it's not even radiation, it's height wave. And it happened in 2011. So none of this is real. But this image went viral and a lot of people got really scared. Of course they got scared. This looks terrifying if you don't know the context. So here I'm trying to illustrate how important the media is and how big a role it played after these accidents. Now, the nuclear industry responded by making things safe. They said, you know what, we don't want this to happen again. This can never happen again. So we're going to learn our lessons, we're going to make everything as safe as possible, and they succeeded. If you look at this graph, this shows death per terawatt hour, which is death per energy, and at the bottom you see different energy sources. This also includes air pollution, which is also the reason why coal is so bad, because it kills so many people in the end. But nuclear energy is the safest. It even tends to be safer than solar power, because apparently when people install them on the roof, they can fall off. So there you go. They really worked on technical safety. It's amazing. The technology is great. But what they didn't do, and what's way more difficult to do, is to address the feeling of safety. See, all this work has been done behind the scenes, but no one really knows in the public what they have been doing. The only thing they remember is the accidents. And that means that combining all this fear-mongering of the media, the accidents, the, the entertainment industry, that a lot of people are very strongly anti-nuclear, still up to today. So going back to Dave and Tom, that kind of makes sense now. Because you have Dave on the one hand, right? He's focusing on content. He's focusing on, you know, we have to make this safer. And in his conversation, that's exactly what he did to me. Because he told me the most essential bits. He told me his name, and he told me his role. That's all he needed. So he disregarded and didn't really think about the feelings that I might have had coming into this environment on my first day. Whereas in Tom's case, Tom doesn't really know any of the content. The only thing he has, the information he got, is from the media, from newspapers that used to be trustworthy, but now with fake news spreading, it's not that much trustworthy. Plus, they trigger our emotions and feelings. So obviously, when the word nuclear comes up, he's angry and scared. But if this is it, 
we can fix that. Because I can teach Tom the facts and figures, and I can help him understand maybe some of the more technical aspects of nuclear energy and take away a bit of his fear. And on the other hand, I can teach Dave to have more attention or give more attention to the feelings. But what if these two aspects are not it? What if there's another aspect that we need to consider? And I call this fantasy. Because we have this concept, right? We have this concept that we're scared of, and it's called radiation. But unless you're in that field, you don't really know what it is. You know it's really dangerous, and you know you can't hear it, you can't feel it, you can't see it, you can't smell it. Uh, what is this? So obviously that triggers the fantasy, and that's why they are. Nuclear energy plays such a role in the media and the entertainment industry. Now, I collaborated with an artist to think of the creatures that you might have in your imagination, some of the fantasy images. And we came up with this. So here we have a really angry little bird and a deer with three heads. Here's a scary lizard with three eyes and a glowing baby in its belly. And just a bunch of glowing rabbits with four ears. Now, we all know that these images are pure fantasy but they do provide the basis for many of the movies and many of the video games that we see all the time. So we can distort and blur out that line between reality and fantasy. A good example of this is Chernobyl Diaries. I don't know if anyone's seen it here, but it starts out kind of documentary-like. There's a group of students or young people that visit Chernobyl, which is real, it happened. They visit the site and they explore what it's like. And then it turns into a complete horror story. All these creatures start popping up and it's terrifying. So it really goes from this real context to this complete fantasy image and storyline. And that's really dangerous because that means that nuclear energy has two sides. And to be fair, the fantasy side is more interesting. We like glowing bunnies. I want to hear more about that. The safety statistics, yeah, I mean, you know, it's maths. But it's really important to consider it, and I'm going to tell you why. There are currently 145 reactors in the world, and 55 are being built. They provide 10% of our global electricity, so that's quite a lot. And over 140 ships are being powered by nuclear energy. Besides that, the reactors don't only produce electricity, they, only, they also generate medical isotopes. And these are substances that are used in hospitals to diagnose and treat cancer, for example. But currently, a lot of these reactors are ending, the end of, are ending their lifetime. And that means that we need to decide whether we want to reinvest and continue using this energy source, or if we want to let it go. But this is a really important decision, because reactors are not easily built. You can put up a solar power in one day, but you cannot build a nuclear reactor in one day. So it's a long process, and it needs strategic approaches, and that means informed decision-making. Secondly, right now we're combating global warming. It's the biggest challenge we've had so far, and we need energy sources that are clean, that are by emission-free, that are affordable, and that allow us to turn the lights on whenever we want, not just when the wind blows or the sun shines. Now, nuclear energy has great potential. It's a great candidate. But it's not in the conversation. When we talk about energy transition, we talk about all these sources. It includes the dirty ones. It includes coal, oil, and natural gas. Yet nuclear, for some reason, yeah, but no. Now, that is something that we cannot afford. We can't afford to just ignore a potential solution without proper evaluation of what it could bring us. So right now, I'm going to challenge you. Challenge you to think about your own perception and think about that line between reality and fantasy and what the fancy aspects might have done to your perception. So really think about the facts that you have or the facts that you don't have, but also the way that you feel about them. Do I feel good with this? Do I not feel good with this? Why not? Maybe I don't understand something. Maybe I just really don't like it. That's fair. But this informed decision-making can only take place after the self-reflection. And that's not easy. When I made this talk, I really struggled, because I thought, OK, how am I going to approach this subject? It's, it's still really taboo in a lot of 
places and, and a lot of conversations don't go that way. But it's important that we talk about it. It's really important that this becomes part of the conversation because we have a decision to make. So please, let's talk about it. Thank you.